Welcome everyone. Welcome everyone uh, to the California ACC. Fit Networking and Career Development event. I'm Megan Pelter. And I'm Pani Mafai. And, um, uh, we're, and we're the Southern and Northern California ACC Fit Chairs. We are thrilled that you could join us today for what will be another exciting and informative session. So before we begin, we'd like to take a few seconds to thank our wonderful esteemed panelists who took time out of their extremely busy schedules to join us tonight. Um, we'd also like to thank the California ACC Board and Executive Committee, especially its president, Dr. Jamal Rana, Vice President Dr. Anthony Hilliard and CEO Leanna Collins for their unwavering support and enthusiasm. This program would certainly not be possible without their tremendous leadership and guidance. We also like to thank our wonderful FIT committee for their dedication and hard work in recruiting all of our wonderful speakers tonight and also organizing this event that will hopefully serve as a valuable resource for both fellows and also trainees considering cardiology. For today, the format of the session will be as follows. We will first start by having our panelists introduce themselves. We'll then discuss several pre-selected questions before opening it up to the audience for further questions and answers. If you do have a question, please submit them in the chat box. Pani and I will then present them to the panelists. Please remember to remain muted during the course of the event. If you do have a question you would like to ask verbally, then please raise your hand and then we will unmute you. So as a reminder, again, this session will be recorded and I'll be available on the California ACC website for further viewing. So with that, we'll go ahead and get started. So first off, we'll have our panelists give us a three to five minute introduction, each outlining their background, training, um, career, and journey within the field of cardiology. So we'll have Dr. Dan Gerber get us started tonight. Hey, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, so uh, my name is Dan Gerber, like you said. Um, I'm from Baltimore originally, um, and I, I started my education out there and did um, undergrad at University of Maryland um, Medical School at George Washington and then came out to Stanford for residency, uh, cardiology fellowship, and then critical care fellowship. Um, and uh, should I, should I get into kind of what led me into cardiac critical care or wait for later? Yeah, sure. You can go ahead and touch okay. a little bit on it. We'll probably have you do like a focused, uh, focused, uh, little sure. dive a little further. Sure. So I, I, as most of you are, um, kind of debating which, uh, career path to take, I started out cardiology, uh, or residency initially, um, interested in EP, um, and as my clinical experience went on, I, I got more interested in heart failure and then specifically uh, managing those patients in the ICU. Um, and I, I did really enjoy my clinic and outpatient experience, but I felt like I was much more engaged and much more um, interested in the higher acuity ICU setting. So uh, I was actually very fortunate to get to spend a lot of time with Dr. Connor O'Brien as well. And so um, uh, he and I kind of uh, we're able to work through this and think through this together to uh, to try to build this career path. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, next, we have Dr. Haywood. Dr. Haywood, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Hi, my name is Tom Haywood. Um, let's see. Uh, I studied theology uh, in undergraduate. Have a undergraduate degree in theology, decided to go into medicine after that. So I went to uh, UCSD Medical School. I trained in San Diego. Uh, and then I went to uh, Loma Linda to do my cardiology fellowship. Uh, between um, my residency in cardiology, I worked in New Zealand and did. Uh, I was a cardiology registrar in uh, Auckland, uh, New Zealand. Um, which was very rewarding. Uh, once I finished my um, cardiology fellowship, I did research when I was a fellow and was able to actually earn some money. So I went overseas after that and I did a year of uh, research in Zurich, Switzerland, Zurich, Switzerland at the University of Zurich uh, in right ventricular function. Came back to Loma Linda. I was a bit of a general cardiologist, but uh, decided that I really liked heart failure. There weren't many heart failure doctors back then. And uh, I, 
kind of created a niche for myself. I started a heart failure program at the Veterans Hospital and that grew. And then I went to Loma Linda and started a heart failure program there and left as director of transplant there. I've been at Scripps Clinic uh, for 16 years and I'm director of advanced heart failure here and also uh, mechanical circulatory support. I also uh, run the pulmonary hypertension program. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, next we'll have Dr. Michelle Kittleson. Hi there, uh, in a great example of work-life balance, you might hear children screaming in the background or me screaming at them to stop screaming, so I apologize in advance. Also, I know it looks like I'm in the witness protection program because it's all dark where I am in the house. So anyway, I don't even know how to set the light filters on my Zoom. Um, so I um, became a doctor because my parents told me to. I'm the fifth generation of doctors in my family and an only child and I had no choice, but from the very first day of medical school it was the most amazing thing I could have ever done. Um, I went to um, Harvard undergrad, Yale for medical school, internal medicine um, at Brigham and Women's and then cardiology at Johns Hopkins. And um, I decided to do cardiology for three reasons. I love pathophysiology more than memorization. I love the evidence base of clinical trials. And I love the fact that you need a history and a physical to actually diagnose a patient. And then heart failure transplant was just a natural transition because I love human drama. And I, I love the various things you can do within the field. And so I've been at Cedar sinai as a heart failure transplant cardiologist now for 11 years. And um, I couldn't imagine doing anything else. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Kittleson. And next we have Dr. O'Brien. Hey, thank you also for having me. Uh, so I am a Bay Area native, grew up in Menlo Park, uh, right around the corner from Stanford, and went east for undergrad and med school, and then came back and, as Dan said, did most of my, or all my training at Stanford. I was there for medicine, cardiology, and critical care, and just took my first job up at UCSF, and we're in the process of building out a cardiac intensive care unit, and so it's been a lot of fun. We're in, uh, it's previously, it was a very small unit, and so we had a blank slate to work with and building things up, so looking forward, forward. to talking to everybody. Wonderful. Thanks for joining tonight. Um, next up, we have Dr. Van Selby. Hi, uh, my name is Van Selby. I'm, um, I'm currently at Kaiser. I'm also a fifth generation doctor, actually. That's kind of a coincidence um, uh, on different sides of the family, but, but overall goes back five generations. So I, um, I started med school at UCSF and I stayed there for all of my training. And I, so I did cardiology. Um, I actually went into it for very similar reasons to what Dr. Kittleson said. It was a pretty easy decision for me. And then um, even I think before I started fellowship, I knew I wanted to do heart failure. It's really the, the 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 thing I truly love in cardiology. I, I just find it so satisfying. And and like she also said, you can do a lot of different things with it. it all at the same time, you know, you can be have great long term outpatient relationships and also a lot of intensive care. I love that balance of it. Um, so I, I I did all my training at UCSF, my heart failure fellowship there, and then I was a, an attending uh, at UCSF for five years doing uh, heart failure, VAD transplant, and pulmonary hypertension. And then um, two and a half years ago, I came to Kaiser San Francisco, and I think this is this is a California ACC event, correct? So every, everyone's in California. You guys probably are familiar with what Kaiser is. It's a it's a huge integrated healthcare system. So we're both the insurance provider and the and the hospitals and, and physician group. Um, we have over four million patients in Northern California and another four million in Southern. And so I'm I'm in the San Francisco Kaiser, which is one of the main cardiology hubs. Uh, about half of my job is pulmonary hypertension. We're, we're the center for pH for Northern California. And then um, the rest of my job is some uh, general cardiology. And then, and then I'm on uh, with, with kind of a focus on heart failure and then, and then some uh, cardiogenic shock. So we have a regional shock team that, uh, that kind of triages and organizes because we have, I think something like 25 or so hub hot, or, or sorry, spoke, uh, yeah, outside hospitals in within our system that, that need to you know figure out what to do when their patients come in with shock. So that's one of the uh, one of the things I do here as well. I'm I'm very happy with the decision to come to Kaiser. I think I'm the only one on the panel who's not at an at an academic medical center. So I'm happy to talk about uh, that as well later. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, next, Dr. Salim, if you don't mind introducing yourself. Hello. Yes, I'm Dr. Salim. Uh, so I did uh, most of my training 
on the East Coast. I went to med school in the Caribbean, uh, and then I did my residency and fellowship in New Jersey. I did my interventional fellowship in Long Island, and then my heart failure training at Baylor uh, in Texas, and then I moved. I kept moving sort of west and ended up in California. Not sure how. I think the winds just sort of took me across the country, um, but we're here now. Um, you know, uh, what drew me to heart failure was that my, my dad had an LVAD. He had a massive MI when I was in med school, and he was a cardiologist himself, I guess, ironies of irony. Um, and so after doing interventional, which was, if I may say, without getting in trouble, like my true passion in cardiology, um, I sort of had a drive to also do heart failure. And so I ended up doing a heart failure fellowship back. Wonderful. Thank you for sharing all that. Um, and next up, right next to you, we have Dr. Tran. Sure, I mean, if you sure. me, I can talk. <laughs> um, so it so happens that both Salim and I are actually at Loma Linda now. Um, I went into cardiology very similar to Dr. Carol Sigmar Keith. I don't have her pedigree at all, <laughs> but I did train under her. So maybe that actually helps me a little. <laughs> so I initially went to med school at Ross, also the Caribbean, did my residency in Connecticut at UConn, came out and to Hawaii actually for fellowship. And um, during my fellowship there, the plan was for me to try to start an advanced heart failure program for the state of Hawaii. So I uh, went up to Cedars where I trained under Dr. Kittleson um, with the intention of going back to start the program in Hawaii. Tried that for a year after lots of work. <laughs> um, and then fortunately it was not moving as I would want to, um, especially without the support that you would ideally need to create a program. So went off to other programs and then eventually came actually to Loma Linda because Josh Chung, who I worked with at Cedars was out here, which sort of drew me back out. And I'm actually from the area, so it worked out really well. So that's why I'm here now. Excellent, so let's move on. Thank you all for introducing yourself. Um, and let's move on to the first question. So the first question for our panelists is how, do you, how did you solidify your interest in your field? Um, so Dr. Gerber, if you don't mind uh, taking the lead on that one, I know you started a little bit on that, but. Sure. Um, so uh, so I, I'm, I'm doing cardiac critical care um, and I uh, did fellowships in both cardiology and critical care. Um, and again, we, uh, I kind of alluded to this earlier, but um, I think that, you know, starting out training, you really don't know what the, what your career is going to look like or what the job is going to look like that you're going to be doing day to day. And cerebrally, I uh, really enjoyed EP, um, but in practice, um, it just didn't quite catch me as, uh, as much as being in the ICU and, um, and taking care of the, like the higher acuity patients. Um, and, you know, I, I think I was one of those, one of those people probably similar to a lot on this panel that um, you know, when I was on my cath rotations, I loved it. When I was on um, you know procedural rotations, I really liked that, but um, I didn't really want to be a proceduralist. Um, and I think that you know similarly, I I got a lot of value out of my outpatient experience, but um, but I thought that really where where I felt m most at home was in the ICU. I think that all my other, all those other experiences kind of helped bring, um, um, bring aspects to, uh, to my training, but, but really I, I felt I, I most enjoyed being in the, the cardiac ICU. Um, and so that, that's really kind of what, what brought me to want to, to build this as a career. Excellent. Thank you so much for your answer. Um, Dr. Haywood, um, how did you solidify your interest in heart failure? Uh, Dr. Hayward, you're muted. So uh, once I came back from uh, um, Switzerland, uh, one of uh, someone had left the VA and they had several uh, heart failure projects uh, underway. So I, I took them over, and these were pretty early heart failure projects using ACE inhibitors. Basically, we would take a patient, consent them. <clears throat> and then put them in the unit and put a swan in. And if, if their pressures were high, we could give them an ACE inhibitor and we gave it to them for a few days to see what they did acutely and then sent them home. And uh, 12 weeks later, they came back and we swan them and to see what happened with the ACE inhibitors. Can you imagine such a project uh, these days? Anyway, I realized that 
you had to have a wedge pressure of 15 to get into the study. And I noticed that everybody that had high neck veins had a wedge pressure over 15. And if you didn't have a wedge pressure of 15, I did all this work and you couldn't get into the study. And everybody that had high neck veins had high filling pressures. And people had told me that neck veins were useless. and They weren't valuable at all. And I thought, well, they seem pretty useful to me. So I said, I, like, I really like doing research. What if I have these patients and I kind of have a clinic with them and I can have my research nurse follow them in clinic and we could get, take extra special care of them. But when I have a study, I could just put them in the study and I treated them by the neck veins, which nobody had ever told me how to do. I had learned how to look at neck veins when I was in New Zealand because all the doctors had trained in London and they were quite good at physical exam, but nobody really cared about the physical exam when they were training me very much. And I really developed this interest in neck veins and I saw that you could really make heart failure patients quite better. You looked at their neck veins and diuresed them and you know we had these ACE inhibitors and they were actually working. Uh, I actually, first time I gave a, gave a beta blocker to a patient, I had to cut it up myself and give it to them. And uh, I, I thought they would die when I gave them a beta blocker because everybody told me you couldn't give patients beta blockers with heart failure, you'd kill them. But the people in Europe seem to be doing it. So I did, I really kind of found this by accident, but basically I got most excited when I saw a heart failure patient and I decided it was okay in my life to do what really interested me. And, uh, I, I didn't need anybody's permission and I just did it. And I, I created the programs that, that I wanted to see and, and to take care of the patients that interested me the most. And I, I thought that was extremely valuable for me in terms of, uh, you know, giving me a lot of satisfaction in my career. I think you should do what you would like to do as much as possible. Excellent point, Dr. Haywood, excellent point. <laughs> Uh, next, Dr. Kittleson, um, can you tell us what solidified your interest in heart failure? Yeah, first of all, I want to say that Dr. Haywood is like a total rock star, and I've never heard those stories before, and I love them so much, Tom. Like, that was so cool. And Diane, I'm so happy to see you even on virtual Zoom. You're like the best fellow ever, and I'm so glad you've done great things. So I, again, I picked cardiology because the path of phys, the evidence-based, the history and the physical. When it came to heart failure, I like the human drama and the variety. And when it came to picking a job, I knew very clearly that I'm not a researcher. I don't love, I, I stayed up at night worrying about research projects, but I slept very peacefully when I was taking care of patients because I felt my effort equaled my achievement. And so I didn't feel like I had the, the constitution or the talent to do full-time uh, research, publish, or perish kind of position. So when I picked my job uh, as a heart failure transplant cardiologist, I think I chose pretty strategically a program where I knew I would be valued for my clinical work and that my job secured be based on that clinical work. And if over time, I wanted to do other fun stuff like explore educational things, uh, national level or uh, some dabble in research a little bit I could, but that my my day-to-day -day life would be on, on clinical care. So I agree with Dr. Haywood. I didn't have a great plan. I've kind of happened to a lot of things that I've done really based on inspired by just loving to take care of patients. Excellent. Thank you again, Dr. Kittleson. And then uh, last panelist for this question, Dr. O'Brien, how did you solidify your interest in critical care, cardiac critical care? Yeah, I, you know, I came into a fellowship in cardiology th really thinking I was going to lean towards heart failure. And one of the, the experiences I started to have, we have a CCU that's very heart failure focused. And I spent some time in our CVICU and started to realize, you know, I really enjoyed mechanical support, but then started to see some uh, opportunities that were in patients that were landing in our MICU who had a lot of heart disease where if that were taken in different context, bringing patients in with mixed shock and bringing that more towards a cardiology focused way of management. I saw a lot of opportunity where we could potentially realize opportunities to improve care, uh, you know, stay ahead of cardiac issues. And it was interesting to um, move into the CCU and away from general medicine and start to miss some of the general ICU work. And so one of the things I, when I was in, 
my cardiology role as a fellow, Dan, I'll tell you this, I got involved in a lot of ICU stuff and started to realize there's a lot of overlap and opportunities for cardiology to grow into that space. Uh, and so then I did you know, ended up pursuing critical care and have been trying to focus sort of on the blend of where cardiology needs to work on uh, hybridizing with processes that are more ingrained in general ICU practice, process improvement and things like that. And that's really where um, what caught my, or really got me excited when I was sort of trying to find my niche when I was a cardiology training. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, so we're gonna move on to our next question, which is how did you all choose your current practice setting, whether it's an academic, private or managed care setting? If any of you um, have experience in multiple settings, then if you could compare them and also let us know why ultimately you ended up in the current setting that you're at. So we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Selby. Sure, so yes, I, I, I have practiced in multiple settings. Um, I, I loved being at UCSF, I was, I, I was there in total for 17 years and, and five is a, um, as an attending, I really liked the environment. I liked, I liked being in academia, working with all the trainees, um, having a lot of exciting stuff go on. Uh, and, and to be honest, I wasn't actually looking for a new job. It's just I, um, Kaiser San Francisco is, is basically entire, like mostly people who have come from UCSF. So I know, knew a lot of people there and, and they used to approach me every time they had a job. And, and they finally came to me once and said, this is the last pH and heart failure job we're going to hire. You should just come uh, interview for it. So, so I did. And, and I think really um, what made me come was the, the group here. It, you, you just meet them and, and everyone's very um, engaged in their work, uh, really, really collegial. They're, they're all really good friends outside of work. It's a very different kind of atmosphere and environment than I was used to. And and I'd say I just I just thought about you know where I'd be happier for the next um, uh, you know 25 years of my career or so and, and and it was actually a very easy decision once I actually came and met people here so that was that was how I chose my job but I also I knew I wanted to be at a place that wasn't necessarily it didn't have to be a, a, a an academic center I knew I did not want to be a big researcher um, uh, I liked it at Kaiser San Francisco I can dabble in that stuff but I, I've always preferred very very heavily. Uh, clinical care. So I wanted to be at a place that focused on that. I feel like Kaiser San Francisco does, but it's also a large enough center. And, and again, we you know serve a, essentially over 4 million people here in Northern California. So we, we have a lot of complex um, uh, care. We do a lot of things here. So I, I, I get some of those benefits. Um, and then the, the, the main trade-offs coming here, I'd say we're, we don't do transplant here. It's all contracted out to, to Stanford and sometimes UCSF, but I decided I was okay with that. Um, and I, I can't be a pure heart failure cardiologist here. I do some general cardiology, which is fine. I, it's, it's okay. Um, but at UCSF, if it was nice, just purely living in a, in a, in a heart failure world. So those are, those are the trade-offs. I'd say the benefits are a, a really great organization with a totally integrated system where everyone is just completely involved, invested in taking the best care possible of these patients. Um, and then also a center that really focuses on work-life balance and, and still you know, lets me do pretty high complexity stuff, which I, which I really enjoy. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, next, we'll have Dr. Salim. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I think Dr. Hayward said earlier is that you have to do what you love, right? So um, a lot of places, um, so I'm an interventional cardiologist and a heart failure doctor. And so I guess my wife says I have Peter Pan syndrome. I never really grew up or chose anything. And so I sort of like to dabble in both. Um, and I have a true passion for both. And so the, the, the job offer at Loma Linda was an institution that could see the value in somebody that could do both. Um, I had a lot of job offers afterwards and interviews that I went on uh, where uh, people would ask me, why don't you just choose one, not the other? Um, There's actually a couple of heated debates at some job interviews with a lab director who said, why would I hire somebody to order LASIKs as an interventionalist? I just want an interventional cardiologist. So, you know, finding um, some of these bigger institutions are very much uh, where the department sort of siloed into subspecialties and you have to fit into one of these little holes or they don't want to hire you. They don't want to waste your time in another department. Um, and so that, you know, Loma Linda offered that where I could be an interventionalist 50% of the time. And so today I got to do uh, left main roto impella supported, uh, you know, bifurcation left main stenting. And tomorrow I'm in heart failure clinic um, and they're okay with it. Um, so it's, a, it's an interesting system that's built that way. Um, yeah, there are smaller academic institutions like Loma Linda where, like Dr. Kielsen said, you know, you can... Uh, you can do some research if you're interested, but at the same time, your clinical work is very much valued and your job security is based on that as well. 
Um, so I tell the fellows all the time, you know, if, if you're somebody who wants to do research, pick something that offers a lot of research work. If you want to do more clinical work, then sort of gravitate towards that, but also don't be sort of siloed into something. If you have multiple interests, you can do multiple fellowships. And the last thing I could have done was maybe an EP fellowship just for fun and do everything, right? Um, but, you know, don't be, don't be dissuaded. I mean, like, like I said, I heard from a lot of different people, like, why are you wasting your time doing this or doing that? Just pick one. And you don't have to. There, there are jobs out there. Um, they're going to be harder to find. I mean, it took me a while to find this job. But um, at the end of the day, if you are happy with what you do, then you come to work happy every day. So. Well said. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll also go next to Dr. Tran. I would think it's uh, why I chose Lumen Lindo is very similar in the sense that I'm very heavily, heavily clinical. I'm not a huge research by any means, and I, I do love taking care of patients. Um, the group itself was a very, when I first met them, it was a very, very nice family sort of type dynamic, but obviously um, uh, still high caliber. So that's why I actually chose to come here. Um, and that's really essentially it, to be honest. I don't have much more to say. Excellent. Well, thank you all very much for that. Um, the next question has to do with mentorship. As we all know, mentorship is very important, either going into general cardiology as a resident or into a subspecialty of either heart failure or critical care. So we're hoping that the panelists next might be able to speak to that. Uh, Dr. Gerber, if you don't mind leading us on that. Sorry about that. I was muted. Um, absolutely. Um, so I think for me, um, uh, again, I think Connor was very supportive uh, and very helpful because you know both of us were trying to um, build this uh, on a coast that it really had not been um, fleshed out yet. Um, and so I think you know both of us were trying to build as big of a network and um, and mentorship group as we can. I think that would be my biggest advice: is um, don't look for one mentor. Um, try to get as many people to help you out as you can, and you might find that one person's a great mentor for one aspect of your career um, or your life. And then you have many others that are helpful in other aspects. So um, I, I basically, during all of my conversations, trying to figure out what I wanted to do with this, um, with this job um, and actually building it, um, I just kept a log of all those conversations. Uh, and, uh, and that was really helpful because I don't have a great memory. So that was really helpful to refer back to. And, uh, and, you know, compare people's advice and, you know, reach back out to people, um, uh, as I needed to. So my, my biggest, you know, advice would be get as many mentors as you can and decide whose advice you like and whose you don't and, you know, get rid of mentors that aren't helpful to you. Um, and, you know, reach back out to, uh, to the ones that are. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. And next we have Dr. Haywood, Dr. Haywood, what, um, what do you choose in a mentor? Dr. Haywood? Yes, come in. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you know, I think mentors basically, the, the important people in my life uh, were the physicians that I wanted to be like them as physicians. Uh, there was a, a research mentor who I really respected and he did uh, basic research. And so I went into the lab and I tried very hard for a year to be a lab-based researcher, and that was not me. So I think it's also good from a mentor. You want to be like them, but actually you don't really like what they do, but you don't know that till you try. So, uh, you know, you, these wonderful people that we meet in medicine that are, they're on fire for what they do. It's good to be around them and to learn from them. I, you know, I've learned how to be a good physician in terms of compassion. I learned that I could respect somebody very much, but I didn't want to be a bench researcher. researcher. I didn't have what it takes to do that. So uh, be around high quality people as much as you can and you'll learn something from everyone. Well said, thank you so much, Dr. Haywood. Um, Dr. O'Brien, um, how, um, how did you choose mentors? Yeah, very much. I would like to echo what both of you said, Dr. Haywood and Gerber. The uh, I think it's especially when you're trying to do cardiac critical care. You know, cardiac critical care is not the best defined 
field thus far. And also the job really varies from institution to institution and having multiple mentors that help you do the various things that you want to do, I think is essential when you're trying to build your career, because there's a whole bunch of different pieces that need to come together. Uh, and I also, the one thing I would say for, in terms of clinical skills or research skills, you know, really, I think it's important to try and find mentors who have, who can to really teach you how to do, or at least manage the components of life that are essential to that practice. So finding somebody who has as much overlap with your eventual job as possible, I think is really important because one of the things that's hard uh, to understand as a trainee when you're starting to build or run larger clinical programs is how much the management of that undertaking or whatever you're in charge of, how much behind the scenes work there is and trying to soak up that knowledge and understand how to how you take on leadership roles in either clinic or research is something to really uh, try to absorb if you can. When, so in identifying people who have those roles uh, when you're in training in sort of following the meetings and general things like that, I think is really helpful. Excellent. Thank you again for that. And then last uh, panelist for this question, Dr. Tran, um, how do you recommend choosing mentors? I think for me, you can learn in every opportunity where you like encounter somebody, meaning you can take the good and the bad, learn what you want to do and what you don't want to do. Um, I definitely toward, I tend to gravitate toward people who I definitely want to em emulate and, and become like. Um, uh, but I also learn from those that I would not want to carry on the same practice. So I feel like you do take the opportunity. I mean, I take the opportunity to learn from every situation. And so, um, but I, I, I agree in the sense that there is, um, when I was out in Hawaii and trying to start a program, there was a lot of administrative stuff that I did not learn in fellowship that I had to pick up uh, from the mentors that were in those roles. And so that was a huge, huge uh, learning curve for me. Um, and so again, it's the people you surround yourself with um, and you try to be like. Wonderful, thank you. So we're gonna go ahead and move on to our next question, which is, um, as you all know, you know, cardiology is an extremely fulfilling yet demanding career. So we would love to hear any advice that you may have on maintaining a good um, work-life balance and prioritizing wellness um, in an effort to avoid burnout throughout your career. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with Dr. Kittleson. Yes, because I'm the very embodiment of work-life balance at this moment. So you are, you are seeing it in action. Okay, so I've got so many theories on this, but I'm gonna boil it down to two things. Uh, first, there's never a right time to have kids. There's never a wrong time to have kids. It's kind of like an LP. If you're thinking you should do it, you should probably do it. Uh, the second thing I'd say is if the secret to having a good um, work-life balance with kids, I think, you need, I think you need two of three things. You need a flexible spouse, family who can help, or dependable child care. So you need two of those three things to make it work. And the final thing I'll say when it comes to having kids and work-life balance is comparison is the thief of joy. Don't, don't look at your co fellow colleagues, PubMed citations or accolades and think about you. For the seven years I spent having kids and or taking care of a newborn, I basically, I don't have seven kids. It was three kids over seven years. Um, I felt it was like, I was keeping my patients alive. I was keeping my children alive and everything else was just an extra. And I was strategic enough to pick a job where I knew that would be okay. And then the final thing I'll say about burnout is I really believe that burnout doesn't happen because you work hard. We love to work hard. We get fulfilled by working hard. Burnout happens if you don't feel valued and appreciated. And the one way I feel valued and appreciated, one, strategically picking a good supportive job, but second is being able to vent with colleagues in a safe space because no job will ever be perfect but if you have that support and space to share your concerns or strategize solutions that really helps so those are my pearls of wisdom or maybe wisdom is too strong a word that's my philosophy wonderful thank you those are wonderful pearls of uh, definitely wisdom um great we'll move on to dr selby next um, I'm, I'm not a great person to, to talk about this. I don't put much thought or effort into, into work-life balance. I think I, I, I do an adequate job for me, but I think one, one thing um, I would definitely say is, is you've got to find a job uh, that you do enjoy showing up to. And, and, and like uh, uh, you were just saying, um, 
uh, finding you know, people, people you can vent with and an environment you're happy to show up to. Uh, I think it's super, super um, uh, important. I think that's one of the reasons I came to Kaiser. I came, I came and interviewed here and everyone was just so like happy to be around each other. And you could just tell, tell so clearly they really, really enjoyed coming to work and, and, and being together and helping each other. And, and it just seemed like a great place where I could see myself for, uh, again, for the next 20, whatever years of my, my career. So I think that's, that's really important. Um, and then the way I, I, I manage work-life balance by just making sure that when I'm, when I'm not at work, I'm, um, you know, doing things that aren't work related. And I think, uh, that does require some, you know, uh, uh, ability to not monitor what colleagues are doing or what other people are doing or what you could be doing because there's always always more that you could be doing but um, but I think for me for me personally it means uh, leaving San Francisco and, and going to the East Bay where I grew up and, and going to Berkeley and seeing my friends and family pretty much every weekend if I'm not working taking trips whenever I can just just finding things to to remove myself from work because I find that if I'm if I'm even just sitting around my house in San Francisco on a weekend with nothing to do, I, I start thinking about the things I could do for work and I just, you know, kind of remove myself from that environment. So that's what I do. I, I will also say if, if anyone's considering Kaiser, they do an amazing job of work-life balance. Um, like two months after I got here, I had to go to um, an all day yoga and meditation retreat, um, like a paid day off to just go to that, learn about that kind of stuff, learn how to deal with stress, learn how to find balance in my life, um, which was just totally, totally foreign to me. Um, you know, in terms of just having a, having an employer that that you know almost forced me to uh, uh, improve my work life balance. I think I think that's one of the greatest things about working at Kaiser's. They they really really want you to have a work life balance. We, during COVID, we've had tons of you know social uh, social things over Zoom and things like it, just to make sure we're all enjoying our our, our, our self outside of work. Yeah. That's Wonderful. It. Thank you. Um, and next, we'll have Dr. Salim. Same question for work life balance. Yeah, I think Dr. Kielsen said it the best. It's just, you know, finding uh, sort of your safe spot at work to vent to the people that, you know, you work with and finding that sort of small family at work where you feel comfortable with these people, um, I think is, is more important than anything else. You know, finding that right job for you. I think we all minimize about, you know, it's a great family and, you know, I fit in here and I'm happy, but it's very important where you feel like this isn't where I want to be during the day. Um, I share an office with Dr. Tran and Dr. Abramoff and half the day we're just joking around and it, it sort of takes some of the stress out of your daily life here at the hospital. Um, and then from your personal life, you know, I think what Dr. Kielsen, you know, says again, rings true. It, you know, there's no right time. Um, you know, my wife lived halfway across the country and I was in Long Island half the time she was pregnant and then uh, in Dallas, the first three months of my kid's life. So sometimes you just have to make do about, you know, putting some priority on your personal life because you won't be happy, I don't think, with any job anywhere if your personal life sort of isn't in check too. So, you know, finding that um, balance where your personal life is sort of all lined up and then finding the right people to work with that make you happy when you're at work I think is very important. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, and as a reminder, we've gotten a lot of good questions from the audience as well, um, but um, please feel free to keep sending them into us and we'd be more than happy to ask them in our uh, next session, which is the open uh, Q&A. So one of the questions um, that we got is that given the current uh, times in the pandemic and the lack of in-person national conference attendance, um, social media has become a more prominent networking tool. Um, so what advice to um, you panelists who are very prominent on social media, what is your advice on using um, it as a fellow um, and how do you recommend the pros and cons of it? Dr. Kittleson, did you wanna jump in a little bit? I know. <laughs> Sorry, I, I didn't call on me. Um, funny, someone just asked me this question today, actually in person, we were having lunch together. Um, I think, um, Twitter, which I, I happen to be active on Twitter, I, I think it's really awesome in some ways and really horrific in many ways. And so my advice to fellows, honestly, honestly, to anyone is to tread lightly, have a thick skin and be prepared that anything you say can be taken the most horrible way and, 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 and be ready for that. So um, I think for fellows, it is what I love about it is that it flattens the hierarchies, it democratizes education. You can have 
Dr. Haywood posting about how he thinks about cardiomems or JVP and you can comment on it and he'll tell you something really wise and that's incredible. So I think perhaps as a fellow, sorry, one second, you guys have to be quiet. Um, I think as a fellow, it's probably better instead of putting yourself out there by tweeting a lot of stuff, maybe until you're comfortable with the medium to do a lot of commenting on the role models and mentors that are on there but be prepared that no matter what you say, someone's going to be unhappy with it. That's, that's my best take. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Um, any of our other panelists on Twitter, do they want to um, uh, answer that too? Yeah, I would say, you know, I think the best part of Twitter is getting information about and making uh, about medicine and that's new or interesting and also making connections with colleagues. Uh, be very careful about anything political or controversial. You know, occasionally I can't help myself because it's just, but you know, these things last forever. And uh, a wise person said, don't go on Twitter if you've had a drink. Don't <laughs> Twitter a drink. That's a bad idea. So uh, I, I think you have to be careful about political things, but, but it's really fun to post a case as long as you're careful to about privacy and stuff. And I've learned an awful lot of things uh, from colleagues who posted cases and just, you see amazing things. And I, I really enjoy that aspect of it, but I don't enjoy yelling at people or being yelled at, uh, that part I don't enjoy. Very well said. Great. Um, we're going to go ahead and move on to our next um, a couple questions about um, critical care fellowships. I'll try to combine one of them. Um, first being, is doing a critical care fellowship required to practice cardiac critical care after heart failure fellowship? Um, and also uh, those in the critical care field, if you could comment on the uptake of cardiac critical care as a career choice um, and the job search market um, on the West Coast. Sure, happy to talk about it. The um, so I think it, it's very dependent on uh, from place to place. You know, there are a lot of uh, a lot of institutions where heart failure runs the CCU. They do a lot of mechanical support, like UCSD. From my understanding, is like a great example of that. And there's a lot of anesthesia backup, and there's a lot of collaborative care. Uh, there are other places, you know, like, and like what we're doing at UCSF is we're trying to build a more closed unit where we're actually collapsing all critical care under critical care cardiology. Um, and yeah, I know some other places, like if you go to Stanford, like where I trained and where Dan is right now, like on our CVICU, you know, you have two attendings, but you really need to make sure that you like they, that you're on an island, right? So for all the MCS, the airway and everything you're doing, so I think it, it really is heavily institution dependent as to what the skill set is that you need to manage the unit. I think you can run things very well in both environments. You, know, you just need to make sure you have the appropriate airway backup uh, for procedures, obviously the appropriate cardiac and line backup, chest tubes, and things like that. So I, I think that there's a lot of ways to skin the cat. The important part that I really think is valuable from critical care training that it helps you with pattern recognition so that you pick up early when tools are causing atrogenic injury, you set, you set yourself up when you institute like ventilator or anything like that for appropriate escalation, de-escalation, and have people on really good planned care pathways. Um, and that skill set, I think, can really be learned uh, through a number of <coughs> pathways as long as you're training, you're exposed to a lot of it. And so I know that, you know, a lot of these places where they have a lot of people in ventilators and the heart failure unit, you get so much experience, as long as it's worked into a care pathway, you can really approach or do it or be very facile and really take good care of patients as long as it's part of your day-to-day -day routine and you build it into the system where you're taking care of patients. Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next question um, is, how is the overall job market for a heart failure um, cardiologist in California? I 
I guess, or, or another way to ask this would be what would be the pros and cons of looking for a job in California in heart failure? Um, I'd say it's tight, tight, tight. Um, I, when, I, when I'm counseling our graduating heart failure transplant cardiology fellows on their future careers, I say you can choose. You can either be totally dedicated to geography or you can be totally dedicated to the kind of job you want. Like you must be an academic heart transplant cardiologist or you definitely want to do clinical work in an advanced heart failure setting only or it has to have a ton of MCS. Or you can say, I have to live in Chicago. I have to live in New York. I have to live in Virginia. But to try to find the exact job you want and the exact place you want is really, really tricky. There's always concessions that have to be made on one side or the other. And I found uh, California to be incredibly tight. And I try to be really honest with that when we have our fellowship applicants who come to interview that just because you have a fellowship spot, it's honestly not a great guarantee that you'll actually have a job around here at the end of it. Got to, got to be fully, fully honest about things. I think as a result, oh, go ahead. I just think we're in a period of transition. Uh, I agree with what Michelle has said. Um, you know, some people, they really want a, a particular job and they will go anywhere for that job. And other people want to live in a particular place and others want to have some balance of that. I would say that you know, most groups now, they have interventionalists, they have EP doctors, big groups. Uh, not every group has a heart failure doctor. I believe that that will change in the future. I think in the future, most big groups will have a heart failure doctor, but we're not at that stage yet. But I think as, as we train, you know, we've only been a subspecialty for about 10 years now. And I, I think that people will, I know certainly here, uh, people recognize how valuable heart failure is as part of the suite of things that cardiologists can provide to the patient. So I think, uh, I'm hoping that, in, that there'll be many more jobs opening up as people realize that. Go ahead, Dr. Selby, I think you were gonna say something next. I, I was gonna say something very similar that I'm seeing more and more people go into less and less uh, kind of traditional heart failure jobs. So people joining joining private groups of like, you know, say a, a 15 cardiologist group who, who decides they want a heart failure specialist. I think there's a lot of advantage to having that there um, in those kinds of groups. And then, and then say, uh, I'm seeing in the Kaiser system, people who are coming out of heart failure fellowships and, and even taking jobs at the more, um, uh, the smaller regional Kaisers as sort of like the local heart failure champion where they're, they're I'd say, I think they're probably about 75% general cardiology, but they at least bring heart failure experience there. They can, you know, see patients and decide if they need to be transferred um, uh, uh, somewhere for say an advanced therapies evaluation or something. So I, I think more, and, and just the, the people I hear about coming out of fellowship are taking more and more of these jobs. So if you're flexible with that kind of thing and you just want heart failure to be kind of a, um, a uh, sort of a focus within a more general cardiology practice, and I think you will be able to find uh, jobs in California. But um, but if you're if you're you know absolutely want to be at a transplant center, those jobs, especially in California, are, are always going to be at a premium. And and you know there are some years where there may just not be any options. I'd like to put in a word for pulmonary hypertension. Our, our fellow got a job uh, specifically because of pulmonary hypertension. I think that's becoming a, uh, an area that was typically seen as something that pulmonologists do, but more and more uh, heart failure cardiologists are doing pulmonary hypertension. And it's a crying need in the community to have people that know how to manage pulmonary hypertension in all its manifestations. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so next question, both uh, Megan and I being women in cardiology, this is a topic that's very near and dear to our hearts. So, you know, for the female panelists uh, tonight, if uh, we would love to hear kind of what your challenges have been, um, what you had to do to overcome being a woman in cardiology and what advice you may have for um, female fellows in training or residents considering the field. So we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Tran. So I think that generally a, a, a thing that we see throughout cardiology, not just in heart failure, um, where women or female representation isn't the same as what we see with our male counterparts. But I think we've actually grown quite a bit. Um, in regards to whether I, I notice a difference, 
To be honest, I would say there is a little bit of a difference, but again, it depends on the person and myself. Um, um, as long as you, I, in, in though, as long as you do good work and you make, stick to what you know and what you like. For me, I'm, I always try to do the right thing for the patient. And as long as, long as I keep on that track and do what I, I do best, I actually am able to shine despite my gender, um, female or male. Um, I, yes, so there's always obviously going to be some challenges, but um, in the long term, and the, um, and the, <laughs> the gist of it, I think we're, we're quite equally in that in the field. Wonderful, thank you. Dr. Kittleson? So, um, you know, when I started out um, in medical school, I, the medical school, my, my parents told me, they sort of conditioned me. They said, you're a woman, you know, my mom is a doctor too. She said, you, you're just, you're, you're gonna be work twice as hard. Everyone's gonna think you're half as good. I mean, that old cliche we've all heard. So I was kind of conditioned even going into medical school. I, I just better do twice as much as I can possibly do and who knows what's gonna happen. So I think conditioned for disappointment everything was a pleasant surprise to me from that step onward. But I would say, of course, I've experienced the slights um, from, from patients, from who were, did, were distrustful of a, a woman uh, cardiologist, from staff sometimes, so do you really know what you're talking about, from, from colleagues? You know, uh, I, I think at some point, I, um, it gets better as you get older, it gets better as you get gray hair. I, I think the best way to combat it, again, goes back to that venting in a safe space and not just venting, but strategizing. So this happened to me, what do you think I should do about it? So I'll, I'll give you two random examples. You know, the patient that calls me honey or sweetie, it's all about context, not labels, right? I have a patient that calls me honey and sweetie and oh, I've, I've gotten him through a valve replacement uh, training plan. He only wants me for his angiograms. I mean, so it's the context, not the label. I have other patients who I can just tell when I walk in the room, they're not going to listen to a word I say, and it doesn't really matter what label they call me. They can just, I can feel the distrust. In that situation, I, I don't, I kind of call out the elephant in the room and say, hey, I don't think we're, I don't think you're, you're buy, uh, buying what I'm selling. Maybe we can find a doctor who's a better fit. You know, I think calling that out is really important. And when it comes to you, when you feel that there's a disrespect based your gender uh, from uh, colleagues, that's when you have your supportive mentors, those people you can go to strategize what's the best way to handle the situation. I think the world's getting leaps and bounds better. It's extraordinary. Um, and I think 99% of my interactions have been fantastic, but it's key to have that support system to strategize when it's not. Excellent, very well said, very well said. Um, the next question from our audience has to do with the schedules of our panelists. So what are some daily or weekly schedules? Um, and is it all inpatient versus outpatient? And how many days of the month are each? So Dr. Gerber, if you don't mind uh, sending us off on that one. Sure. Um, so my, my schedule is kind of just getting started um, since I'm a new attending this year. But um, basically, I wanted to build a, um, a focus on inpatient schedule so that I was uh, on when I'm on uh, and able to kind of feel like I was off when I left work. Um, and so my my role is mostly inpatient. It's mostly ICU time with a few um, a few weeks here and there of like general cardiology or consult service. And then um, and then I do one day of clinic per week on non ICU or non inpatient weeks. So it's it's heavily inpatient and ICU. Excellent. Thank you very much. Dr. Haywood, what is your, what is your schedule like? Let's see. Oops. Dr. Haywood? I'm coming back. Here I am. Sorry. No worries. Okay. Um, uh, we have, uh, we're about two thirds clinic and one third inpatient. Uh, so uh, when I'm uh, outpatient, uh, we have specialty clinics and I have my regular clinic. One of the amazing things about being a heart failure doctor is I have patients I've taken care of for 20 years now. And I, I know Michelle has this experience. That's, that's quite an honor to, to manage patients all those years and to help take care of them. I have, uh, I'm getting uh, more towards the end of my career than the beginning. So I'm taking more time off. I have, uh, afternoons off and I'm taking much more vacation than I used to. Um, what a, 
we have a lot of flexibility in our scheduling that I really appreciate. That's one thing that I hope all of you have is that uh, you try to uh, have uh, some autonomy in your life and your scheduling so that your schedule uh, fits your life and you help with this work-life balance. Excellent, thank you very much, Dr. Hewitt. And then Dr. Selby, um, can you walk us through a little bit of your own schedule? Sure, it, it's pretty varied and that's, that's actually kind of how I like it. I, I like to, to dabble in a lot of different things. So um, half my job is, is pulmonary hypertension, which is a combination of both um, uh, clinics and then also being on the inpatient service, which, which means both uh, rounding on patients in the hospital, but then also just fielding calls from all over the region. So again, we support 20 something hospitals. So we get calls from pulmonologists and cardiologists about both PAH, so like actual pulmonary arterial hypertension, but also just I'll get calls like, oh, this guy's got a high PA pressure on his echo. What should I do about it? So, so just a lot of that kind of stuff. It, it, it's something sort of unique to Kaiser, the amount of just sort of giving advice over the phone to, to, to providers at other hospitals. So um, that's half my job. And then when I'm uh, not doing pulmonary hypertension, I do a lot of different things. I attend in the ICU uh, something like eight weeks a year. I do inpatient consult weeks about six weeks a year. I have, um, when I'm not in the hospital, I have, I have clinic one to two days a week. I, I read echoes. Um, and then I, I'm in the cath lab one or two days a month doing right heart caths and heart biopsies. So, uh, so it's a nice varied schedule, which I like. It keeps me from getting bored with anything. I think one of the reasons I like heart failure is because it, it, it's also a, a, a pretty, it's a pretty, you know, you can do a lot of different things in it, meaning clinic, ICU, regular hospital, um, and, then, and then cath and biopsy. So I, I like having all of that in my, uh, in my schedule. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so next question, um, as we all know, the pandemic has drastically changed everyone's life globally. Um, for us going through cardiology training during the pandemic also provided its own challenges and certainly affected our training. Um, how would you all think um, the pandemic is going to change the field of cardiology in the future? Um, and also what advice do you have on how to adapt and evolve as we're faced with, um, you know, future challenges as, you know, definitely life will continue to surprise us with these things that, um, you know, and it is a trait that we need to have. Um, so I would love to hear your advice on that. So we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Salim. And you, I'd be, yeah. Why am I answering this question? Um, okay, so <laughs> I was like, not me, anybody but me. You can um, pass if you really don't want it's it. It's really interesting. So, you know, I've been in attending for a year. I trained, I did my heart failure fellowship um, when the pandemic was started. Um, and so half my heart failure fellowship was like in the real world and the other half was in this like quasi uh, COVID world that we live in nowadays. And so it was a huge difference. And I think from the perspective of how, uh, you know, hospitals do things from a transplant program perspective, I think that things have definitely changed. Um, I think now we are starting to get back to uh, some semblance of normalcy. Um, in the intervention world, everything completely stopped. So we got to a point where we weren't doing any procedures. You know, we were only doing STEMIs. Um, you know, it was a different experience of trying to do STEMIs in the world of COVID where we were throwing on pepper suits just to get patients from the ER. And so it very, very much changed everything we did. Um, when you look at things from uh, uh, like the CardioMEMS programs, they all basically collapsed during the, the days of COVID. Uh, there were no CardioMEMS programs. We we're just getting ours off the, off the, uh, the ground and running again. Um, ECMO programs turned into VV ECMO and that's basically it. So it basically changed a lot of the things we did from the world of critical care, intervention, heart failure. Um, I think we're starting to get back to um, some semblance of normalcy. So I think for uh, for you guys sort of navigating the world now coming into looking at jobs and stuff, I think we're, you know, at least from my perspective, I think we're slowly getting back to normal. Um, I think a lot of the heart failure programs, again, like uh, when I was a fellow, a lot of stuff just got put on hold for, for months. Programs weren't doing any transplants. and It was very hard to know what to do. And I think those days are basically over. I think some of the things that we are now navigating um, is decisions on vaccine mandates and other things that are very political. Um, do we make those mandates for our patients that we're going to transplant? Or do we not? Um, you have a lot of heated discussions with your patients in clinic, like, why are you forcing me to do this? The same things that we see sort of in the media. Um, and like Dr. Haywood said earlier, you know, you have to tread very lightly with these political things, right? 
Um, you can't have too much of a, your own personal opinion that you put into it. Um, but then again, when you're part of a program, you guys have to make a decision what you're going to do. So these are things that you guys will tackle as fellows going to the new world as attendings. Um, and you will have to have an opinion about them. But I think overall from a business perspective and sort of workflow environments, I think we're getting close to where we were before. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. O'Brien, same question. I'm, I'm probably the worst person to ask. I got, I was in the ICU all the time and we do a lot of EV ECMO. So our, we just got busy. <laughs> um, but it definitely does change a lot of how we, so we ran, you know, we have a shock program at UCSF and uh, it's, it's very interesting how to think about how you, these programs compete because once you start committing your ECMO circuits to COVID patients in particular, um, they, you know, they take months to come off and that very much influences what you do with the rest of your cardiac program. Like, you know, do you have do you bring patients, how many circuits do you leave available for post-cardiotomy, bringing in patients post-shock, they tend to be on circuit for a very long time, or during cardiac shock, they can be on circuit for a very long time. Um, so it definitely posed a lot of resource utilization questions, and we had to be efficient, um, and also be really efficient when you're bringing people from places where you don't have all the details. So outlining care pathways and building institutional um sort of just agreements as to who can go on circuit, who can't, and working in sort of multidisciplinary teams to make sure that we're allocating our resources appropriately. Um, and it really, it was, it was interesting challenges and it was definitely, in some ways it was really helpful because it, it forced us to answer questions that I think a lot of us probably grapple with all the time in terms of you know, appropriate resource utilization, but it really forced the issue in ways that we don't commonly get pressured. Um, so, but I thought that was a really constructive development in the critical care world, sort of making sure do we really feel like this group of patients or should we start creating the criteria for really making sure we're doing the right thing for the right people. Excellent, thank you so much for that. Um, the next two questions from the audience are uh, somewhat similar, both uh, related to cardiac critical care. The first one is, um, did you attend or ever consider attending in a MICU? Why yes or no? And the second portion to that question was, um, did you ever feel like you struggled with multiple bosses, i.e. Um, pulmonary critical care as well as cardiology, especially when you were working to create a new program or line? Dr. Gerber and Dr. O'Brien, did you wanna take the lead on this? Sure, I, I can start. Maybe Connor can, uh, can yeah. fill things out, but... Um, uh, so I, I think uh, I, I do attend in the uh, the VA ICU, um, and uh, for me, part of that is just keeping up the ICU skill set, um, and and I find it fun and interesting. Um, and I think in terms of um, in terms of your your boss uh, and who who you're um, who you're kind of answering to, um, at least the way that. Uh, the, the job description works at, at Stanford. I, you know, my, my boss is the um, cardiology chief. Um, and there is some navigating the politics between um, the fact that you're working in multiple different units uh, among, you know, ED people and palm crit and um, uh, anesthesia and, uh, and navigating that definitely has its challenges. Um, but um, you like, for me, it, it, the the line of command is, is is somewhat clear. Like you know, I am in the Department of Medicine with a cardiology chief, and that's that's my boss at the end end, end of the day. Like that's where my paycheck comes from. That's who I have to answer to. Um, and it's just a matter of funneling uh, everything else that I do um, in like back to or towards um, the cardiology division. And I so I think that the, it's, it's a great question. I think it actually the answers. Um, really feed on each other. So I, I don't do MICU time. I do all cardiac ICU and CV ICU time. And it's I th when you are taking on, especially cardiac critical care for a lot of places that are starting to grow critical care cardiology groups, uh, what you find is that you're in a practice where you're trying to change things. So a lot of what we do, you know, places like if you are only taking heart failure in your ICU, 
you don't necessarily need a cardiac intensivist, right? Like heart failure has been doing that thing for a long time and they really know how to take care of those patients. If you're going to start taking on a lot more mixed shock, having anybody with heart disease who has any general critical care problem coming into your ICU, that's where our skill set's a little bit different, right? And we have a different, like, where we sort of fit into the world a little bit different from our predecessors. And so I think one of the challenges when you're doing that is you start to have to build a unit where care can be reproducible. So if you are in a, you know, a CCU or CICU and the people who come on after you don't have the same skill set, it's really hard to say if you're the ED and we really are we're working with the ED and you want to bring in, you know, all the post arrest or something and you need a care pathway. If the people who are coming in aren't facile with the cooling, the anesthesia, how it works, and you know, make dealing with all those counterbalancing issues, it may not be the best place for patients to be. And so, if you're coming out of critical care, one of the challenges is if you want to work in multiple units, then you're not necessarily available to the CCU enough to change so that that you so that the care can be for the patients can be really carried forward, and then all the process improvement stuff that comes with doing that you can complete it. And like somebody can really take ownership of the leadership issues and walk them through these processes. A lot of, you know, changing ICUs and practices is a big undertaking. You have to train nurses, PAs, residents, and have like the call structure. There's just like a huge layer of work. So sort of recognizing that by spreading yourself, then you can really limit your ability to affect practice in an uh, environment that a lot of these places is dynamic and changing. Um, and so that's one of the things I encourage people when you're looking at jobs, if you really are doing critical care, the more time you're in one environment, the easier it is for you to change things so that you can optimize, like really employ everything you're trained to do because it's different, right? And people are growing new groups and trying to find out what do we, what can we offer that's different or better, or how can we, you know, work together with other people in ways that weren't previously realized. And, and I think that when you're looking for jobs, that's a really important point because you're going to have to decide whether you want to, tr you know, try to slowly make changes in a place that has a kind of a, a pretty well-developed program um, already, or if you, you know, want an opportunity to kind of take over and build things, um, you know, somewhat more fresh. Um, and I think that really depends on where you go. And so you kind of have to decide what it is that you're that you're trying to uh, trying to do, um, or what you want um, when you're picking a, a place to go. Wonderful, thank you. Um, so, next question is: um, If you had a chance to do something differently, what would that be, um, and how would you use that to advise our fellows on kind of uh, why that is that you would do something differently? So, um, we'll go ahead and get started with Dr. Selpy, if you could take that one. Sure. Um, I, I, I would say no for me personally. I think the main um, the main thing is figuring out where you want to go, uh, you know, what kind of environment you want to be in and, and practice in. And I think it, it can be hard to know as soon as you, uh, right as you're coming out of fellowship. I thought I, I thought I'd spend my whole life at UCSF for sure. Um, I, I uh, you know, it was a good environment. I was, I, was, I, I enjoyed it there and, and I thought I'd stay there. Um, but, but then this other job, uh, uh, came up. So sometimes I ask myself, well, should I just have gone to Kaiser straight out of fellowship? Um, and, and it, it absolutely would have been better from a financial standpoint, um, and from a, just a, you know, practical standpoint to have gone there, but, but I'm actually, uh, very glad I, I, I spent some time in academia and, and, and saw what it was like and, and was able to decide it wasn't for me. So I'm not saying everyone should take a job in academia, but I think you should just take the job that feels the best to you at, 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 when you finish training and then and then if something better comes along or if you decide it's not right for you uh absolutely feel free to take another job i think very often people do stay in one job for a long long time but if if uh if it doesn't feel exactly right and something else comes along i think i think it's important to be uh to be open to it wonderful thank you um, and with that, I think that brings our program for tonight to a close. It's been an absolute pleasure, pleasure to spend the last hour or so with you all. Um, again, we'd like to thank our wonderful panelists for their time, their amazing advice and valuable pearls. We'd also like to thank the California ACC Executive Committee for the opportunity to provide fellows and residents with this tremendous resource. Um, and lastly, we'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us tonight. 
Excellent. And again, I echo Pani and thank everybody for joining us tonight. And as a reminder, the session is recorded and will be available for your viewing on the California ACC FIT website, as well as YouTube channel. Um, please make sure to join us again tomorrow for our next and final last session, uh, which is where we join the uh, adult congenital panelists uh, to further explore that subspecialty of cardiology. We look forward to seeing you then and have a great evening. Thank you. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you.